I'm uh, pleased to say that we've been doing this for um, going on the better part of a decade. Uh, Dr. David Riggs is with us tonight. He's the director of the John Wesley Honors College and I believe one of the finest uh, places to study um, in the United States. And having been to a lot of colleges just in the last few weeks, uh, I'm always using this as a standard of what's going on here for the life of the mind and of the heart. And so welcome here this evening. I'm Jerry Pattengale. I'm the assistant provost here at the university. Dr. David Wright, the provost, was going to be here, but he's actually in meetings about buildings uh, for the Honors College itself and, and uh, uh, some great things happening in the life of this institution. Athens and Jerusalem Seminar is a time for us to look at both what we study uh, in God's Word and what we study in books about what uh, has been revealed to us and in other works and how that plays out um, in civilization in general and specifically with each of us. Some people say it's where the rubber meets the road for us. But one of the things that's been in, in, in David's journey, in Dr. Wright, in Dr. Uh, Riggs' journey throughout, from his time at uh, Zeus Pacific through Princeton and Oxford to here, is that early on he was challenged in a way that he could worship God with his mind because we're called to do that. And uh, I think this is a way for us to sharpen uh, our skills to do that. I often joke that my dendrites are not um, as, as well, well rooted, you might say, as some others, and I've just been fortunate through the years. But these are the types of things that help us um, to root them a little more deeply and to um, also to see them to stretch. We have two uh, wonderful guests here um, this evening. And before I introduce them, I'm going to ask one of our new professors who certainly has been blessed uh, in the areas of putting thoughts together systematically. Uh, Dr. Drury, would you come and lead us to the throne of grace? Let us pray. Father, we come before you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and with uh, thankfulness on our hearts and joy that you have made yourself known, that you are not a mute God who cannot speak for himself, but has spoken, and continues to speak. And so, Lord, we are so thankful that we are empowered by you and your spirit to speak of you, to think about who you are, to speak uh, words to you and about you to others, and to, to seek to speak more clearly and more truthfully about you in this world. We thank you, God, for the opportunity that each of us have of the blessing of studying. This is not an opportunity or privilege given to everyone. So we have the time and leisure to receive them as a gift from you. We're thankful for it. And that we could use this in your grace as an opportunity to think not only about ourselves, about things that may interest us, but most of all that we would think and speak of you. So God, we are so thankful. We also are expectant. We come here with expectation in our hearts to hear true, faithful, and clear words about you, that we would even hear your voice in the midst of the conversation today. So we come with that expectation, uh, trembling with humility, because it's only in your grace that we know you and that you speak to us, but also with boldness and with expectation and with confidence and assurance that you have revealed yourself and that we do know and speak of you. And so with that humble boldness, we come before your throne in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, and ask that this time would be honoring to your name. And as it glorifies you, that it would also edify us and build us up as your servants. We pray all of this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, John. Wish I could go back to school just to take classes from students that I've had uh, who far surpassed me. Um, 
We have two special guests with us this evening, and I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Todd Ream, the Senior Scholar for Faith and Scholarship, uh, who's also uh, helping to lead the John Wesley Honors College for arranging um, these visits. And these two guests, Dr. William Abraham, uh, he is the Albert Cook Outler Professor of Wesley Studies at SMU. And uh, this year he has a sabbatical of sorts. I don't think that you're the type that ever truly takes a sabbatical. Uh, in an hour and a half this morning, I had a refresher course in philosophy. It was like cramming in about four years of classes in an hour and a half, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Not sure what I understood, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. Actually, it was a very rich conversation. And uh, he's been able to spend some very uh, intense time. He has an another book, probably the first of four, in a major series uh, coming out. And so we're pleased to have you here, uh, really, as the host to uh, interview Dr. Stephen Long. Uh, Dr. Long has several books out. You have their full biographies on the back of uh, your program tonight. But you've been reading one of his uh, most recent works, Speaking of God. Uh, in that book, he says towards the end, before Pontius Pilate, really Jesus is saying what he said throughout the Gospels. And we're here to unpack what you have talked about, and who better to do that than Dr. Abraham. It's really a pleasure to have both of you here. Thanks for joining us. Well, let me begin by saying it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I don't know what you've done up here in Indiana Wesleyan, but uh, I love this place. <laughs> this is my third visit, I think, within a period of about 18 months. So it's a, it's a wonderful delight to live to leave um, the, um, what shall I call it, shall we say the high living and low thinking up there at Notre Dame? <laughs> <laughs> and come down here to the... Uh, low living, no, the high living and low thinking of Indiana Wesleyan. No, I'm being funny here. It's a great pleasure to be here and it's a pleasure to be able to have a conversation with Steve Long. Steve and I have known each other for several years. Uh, our backgrounds are quite different. Um, I come out of Ireland, I don't know where you're from, round the corner actually here. <laughs> He's a native of Indiana. Um, we both come out of the Methodist tradition. Uh, Irish Methodism and you, the mainstream Methodism over here. I was trained in the analytic tradition in philosophy and then uh, wandered into theology because I got bored in yeah. philosophy. <laughs> and Steve is much more sort of at home in the more continental tradition. Uh, there's a story behind that that we'll not get into here. And he's also deeply immersed in the life and work of Aquinas and in the medieval world. And for that, I just uh, have enormous admiration for you. And a slew of books are just very, very impressive. And the one that we're looking at here, of course, is his most recent book, which is Speaking of God. Now, the way we're going to proceed here uh, this, uh, this evening is as follows. I'm going to, first of all, ask uh, Steve to give us a brief overview of what he was doing in this book. It's always nice to get it out of the horse's mouth and get it straight from the author as to what they wanted to do. And then what I want to do is to raise initially a series of about four questions. Now, we're getting close to St. Patrick's Day, so you're going to give me a bit of leeway. <laughs> yeah. And I can sort of extend this a little bit. And if he doesn't get the question the first time around, I'll make sure he gets it the second time around. <laughs> so, uh, initially the procedure will be that I'll ask Steve to share uh, a brief overview of the book. As he goes into that, I want to just say how much I appreciated this book. Um, this is not a book for the faint-hearted. You've got to shut off all of that technology, turn off the internet, and really sit down and read this from cover to cover, as you've discovered already. It's also a very bold book, in that he's taken on a series of issues, the relationship between faith and reason, uh, the nature of theological discourse and language, the nature of truth. These are, these are big, big topics. And uh, I love the boldness and the courage that's gone into that. And uh, the other thing I want to say about this before I, I turn it over to Steve is that when you write a book like this, if you make a mistake, 
And I'm, of course, not saying that there's any mistakes at all in this book. Huh? But if you make a mistake, it'll be an illuminating mistake. So don't make a stupid mistake when you do your work. Always make a mistake that's really significant and illuminating. And so we'll, we'll find out as we proceed as to how many illuminating <laughs> mistakes are in this. So Steve, it's wonderful to have Thanks. you here. And uh, I, I, I uh, offer you now time to uh, take five or six, ten minutes and let us know what you're doing here. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation. It's good to be here. I did uh, grow up in this area, Marion, Indiana was the place I went to to escape Wabash, Indiana, where I graduated from high school. So driving that road brought back a lot of memories. So it's really, it's really good. I think this is the first time I've been back invited into the county since I left. I don't know why. But uh, it's really good to be here with, with uh, Dr. Abraham. You'll see right away that he has a keen analytical mind, which is always a bit frightening. Um, and uh, he and I have actually engaged each other's work now four or five times in public and other times in, in private and it's always uh, very helpful to me so I'm really thankful Billy um, for your, your presence. This book began as a sabbatical project several years ago and the, the heart of the book is to address the question what are we doing when we speak of God? What does our language do? Does it achieve its reference? That is to say when we speak of God does the, the word just sort of go out there and it, it doesn't really describe anything? And if it does describe something, what does it describe? Since God is not an object in the world that can be designated. And that's a crucial point in this book. I begin by the assumption that God is the God revealed to us in Judaism and Christianity. That God is not an object in the world. God is not like the fruit flies I studied in biology class. Right? That you can put under a microscope. So is, is it is it rational to speak of God? This became more problematic in the modern era than it was prior to that for a variety of reasons. Um, and that's what I tried to address in this, in this book. Now in, one, in the one sense you might say, well that's just a completely academic question because of course, who, who raises these questions other than theologians and philosophers? I go to church every Sunday and in my church someone will say something like, this is the word of the Lord after we read scripture. To which people say together, thanks be to God. And I'm always stunned by that. Nobody ever says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't you know that we don't have access to the epistemological conditions that allow us to know how our language refers to God? You know, they say, thanks be to God. I think it's very important that we, that we do say that. But part of what I want to do in this book is explore the, 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 the conditions for our speaking of God and why they had become problematic in the modern era. Now one of this, one of the reasons I did this is because I don't believe that all speaking of God is equal. Some is better than others. And it's not always related to the strength of one's piety. How do we determine what good speech is from bad speech? My wife also grew up in this area, graduated from Anderson College, she's a nurse. She knows how hard I work at theology. She's sometimes puzzled by it and she says to me, how do you know when you make a mistake? When I make a mistake, people die. What happens when you make a mistake? That's an important question and it kind of haunts me. And I do want to speak well of God as a theologian, as a pastor, as a teacher. I don't want to just speak of God, I want to speak well of God. So this, this book is an attempt to try to get at that question. Now if all speaking of the God if, if all speaking of God was the same, if we all had sort of had some you know equal right to speak of God however we wanted, then all speaking would have the same uh, uh, valence. To say God is would mean nothing more than to say God is not. Or to say God is my friend would have the same valence as to say God is my friend Bob. Now you know, don't you, that that latter is not right. My friend Bob's a very holy man. Uh, graduated from Taylor University with me and he's done great ministry all his life. But he's not God. So how is it that you know that? Or, or say sometimes we sing a hymn, he's got the whole world in his hands. You know the next question is not, how many hands does God have? And you know that if you ask that question, you wouldn't have understood how we were using the language. So how are we using the language? Well, one of the things that I began, and I assumed in this book, 
um, um, that I wanted to face up to two realities. Two realities that I think are descriptively accurate. The first is, all of our speaking is always historically located and culturally conditioned. I speak about God with my Indiana English accent. Didn't know I had one until I went to North Carolina. People kept saying, where are you from? You just have the most interesting accent. Second, all speaking of God assumes some version of metaphysics. Metaphysics. Now, if you don't know what metaphysics is, talk to the provost and get a class in metaphysics because it's very important. And uh, uh, we, we need those kinds of philosophical questions. Meta just means beyond. Just means beyond. Metaphysics is an ancient discipline. There's a variety of kinds of metaphysics. But it assumes that we can speak about things which are other than things we can designate. It assumes we can speak about things which are other than simply those things referred to in our historical cultural context. So the question and really the challenge of this book is how do you bring those two claims together? To acknowledge what in, what in modernity is called the linguistic turn, the, the turn to language and the cor correlative assumption that our speaking is always historically and culturally conditioned. And at the same time, to affirm that our speaking about God is something more than just speaking about our historical and cultural context. Now, the way I think those two are brought together, and here's where I'm a dogmatic theologian and not an analytic philosopher, is in the Incarnation, in a gift to be received. And the question, I think one of the crucial questions that we'll debate is, is that fideism? Now, fideism is something we both agree is bad. Fideism basically says, it's true, but I have no rational way of demonstrating or showing it. It's true simply because I assert it as such. So, so I, I begin with the Incarnation and argue that the Incarnation is essential to understanding the way language functions because this is a word that signifies, which is on the one hand, thoroughly historical, contextual, culturally located. Jesus of Nazareth, born of Mary, the Virgin, suffered under Pontius Pilate. He's fully human. He's that kind of sign. And yet at the same time, this sign exceeds its context because he's also divine. Second person of the Trinity. And in this one person you have these two natures working together in such a way that they are one. That they are one. And so for me the core practice of Christianity and the core practice that makes sense of our use of language of God is the fact that we worship Jesus as God without confusing humanity and divinity. So now, now there's two things that I that I wanted to that I want to do in this in this work with respect to the incarnation. The first is I don't want to justify the incarnation on grounds other than the incarnation. This is where you can ask Dr. Drury about Bardianism. This is where I would be a Bardian. Um, I think sometimes that makes Dr. Abraham nervous. I don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> but but. But the Bardian, the Bardian in me wants to say that if you can justify the Incarnation on grounds other than God's own speech, then in one sense you've mastered God. You've, you've, you've found grounds by which you can justify God. And if you can do that, you should worship those grounds. I mean, in, I used to teach in the seminary, and we used to give people a Masters of Divinity. You should pray for purgatory if you think you've mastered divinity, right? So I, so I want to affirm that re revelation conditions all things without itself being conditioned. That's a quote from Karl Barth. Revelation conditions all things without itself being conditioned. Revelation is, w we speak about God because God has spoken. That's what authorizes us. But I also want to say that what we say about God is true. And that is true is not just... Um, uh, indifferent. It's not just um, uh, irrelevant. The truth matters. And therefore, we should be able analogically to find in the created order signs 
of this truth that God speaks in Christ as the condition for the possibility of all truth. And that's what I tried to do in this book by drawing upon a theologian, a Catholic theologian named Hans Urs von Balthasar and his retrieval of a metaphysical principle that truth is the transcendental is a is a um, truth is the transcendental uh, a predicate of being. Now that's probably not something that just readily falls off the lips. You probably haven't. Uh, 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 it's not something that comes you know just out of math class. Uh, to say that truth is the transcendental predicate of being is to say that you cannot live and act in the world without assuming truth. Even someone who asserts there is no truth has made a truth claim. So truth is unavoidable. Truth is inevitable. And nonetheless, I think truth is mysterious. And I don't think the philosophers can ultimately give us a satisfactory account of truth precisely because truth is a transcendental predicate of being. Um, so, in this work what I wanted to do then is defend the mysteriousness of truth and at the same time its inevitability and suggest that the Christian doctrine of the Incarnation helps render our everyday reality that truth is unavoidable and inevitable and yet can't be mastered intelligible. And then one other thing I tried to do in this book. One of the things that troubles me about contemporary theology is its party spirit. In a sense, you know, I, you've, you've read the Bible, I take it. Students at IWU. I belong to Apollos, I belong to Cephas. Well, in theology, theology is pretty much characterized by the university you go to, or the party, or movement, or professor you sign up with. And I think that's deeply problematic. I belong to the Princeton Bardian School, I belong to the Duke Yale School, I belong to the... I, I think one of the things I wanted to do in this book is not to invite people to sign up for a theological movement, or a theological person, as if any of them had all the, the, the right answers. But to be concerned about the things those movements and persons are concerned about. So in essence, all I hope this book does is change the conversation. So that we'll begin to speak as theologians boldly about the truth of God and accept that our language can achieve its end. And then one more thing, then I'll stop. The reason I think we have trouble in the modern era, speaking of God, is because of two historical trajectories, which you could call the Kantian for the philosopher Immanuel Kant, or the Hegelian for the philosopher Hegel. And in the Kantian trajectory, some Kantians, perhaps not Kant, but some Kantians think they know the epistemological conditions for the possibility of our use of language. And by that, I mean they know a priori what language can do. And so they, so they destroy its mysteriousness. And they, they a priori argue language cannot speak of God. So any speech about God is not irrational or rational, it's irrational. God becomes a sublime about which nothing reasonable can be said. That's the Kantian trajectory. And I think that has to be challenged if we are to speak well of God. And I think, I think its epistemology is, is inadequate. So um, I wanted to challenge that throughout this book. The other is what you might call the left-wing Hegelian. And this is a theology which says, all speaking of God is ultimately so culturally conditioned that it's really speaking about ourselves. So when we speak about God, what are we talking about? We're talking about ourselves, our own experiences. You find this sort of in progressive Protestantism with liberations, various liberation theologies. Sometimes you find an evangelical theology about what really matters is the state of your sort of evangelical experience. So I think these two, these two trajectories are deeply problematic and prevent us from speaking well about God. 
And if in this book all I can do is drain the swamp <laughs> and, 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 and clear out some way for somebody else to come along and do some, some good building, then it will have uh, achieved its end. So with that, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks so much. Um, I want to start with the role of the Incarnation in your proposals. Because actually I find it bizarre. <laughs> yeah. That's one of my favorite words, it's bizarre. <laughs> For you, somehow, if you don't have the Incarnation at the very heart and center of your proposals about language and truth mm -hmm. and so on, faith and reason, uh, then it's deeply flawed. Yeah. Now here, here's my worries. First of all, before you even utter the claim that God was incarnate in Jesus, you're already committed to a whole series of truths about what God has done before Jesus shows up. So what if you're a Jew before Jesus shows up? <clears throat> You've no access to the Incarnation. Or what if you're a contemporary Jew who rejects the doctrine of the Incarnation? Uh, does this not mean on, on, on your analysis that it's impossible for them to have either a theory of truth, a proper theory of truth, or be able ultimately to say anything that's actually true about the world? Yeah. That, I mean, that, I think that's, a, that's an important question. It's a, a question we should raise. Um, um, whenever I get on an airplane, I don't ask the pilot, do you know the Nicene Creed? Right? Uh -huh. I asked the pilot, do you know how to fly an airplane? And the truth of being able to fly an airplane, the things that he knows, which have to be true if the plane works, are not necessarily dependent upon the incarnation. Is that, does that reframe the question properly? Well, the, pro the problem, I mean, it seems to me you've got a dilemma here, that either you're going to say that all claims to truth and all theories of truth have to in some sense be derived from the incarnation, and take that all the way to the bottom and say if you don't have that, then you don't have truth. Or you're going to allow these truths, like your fellow flying the airplane, or the person who's going to make the beer on St. Patrick's Day, yeah. they get it right, right, but they don't know anything about this. So it seems to me you've got a fundamental dilemma here. Either you've got to give up your theory of truth, or you're going to have to give up the claim that these people actually, independently of the incarnation, have access to yeah. truth. Or, uh, I, I think I would challenge the either-or at this point. I think it's an unpalatable either-or in this sense. Um, so so, so in, in one sense the answer would be yes and no. Yes, the incarnation is necessary for the truth of the world. And without it, the truth of the world cannot be seen. No, not every particular truth claim has to be directly related to that reality. But where, where I think I would say um, uh, um, the Incarnation does illumine truth is, one, it makes, it helps us make sense of the fact that truth is inevitable and you can't escape it. That the world is not just utterly random. And if the world is utterly random, I don't see how you'd be able to do anything more than have a kind of reductivistic account of truth. All right, well, let me make a concession and then okay. see where we can go from there. Um, I mean, both of us want to agree that the ultimate and final revelation of God, this side of the world to come, is in Christ. And therefore, that if you want to know who God is, that's where you've got to turn to. <laughs> sure. And if, uh, and further, that when you live into that truth, when you inhibit, when you uh, when you inhabit that world, and cross over into the world given to us in Christ, then you're going to come back and say everything else. I want to say now. I may need to reflect on it afresh in the light of what I've seen in Christ. I mean, in the medieval theories, which you know better than I do, for example, in Bonaventure, uh, Bonaventure says you know everything in and through the work of the Holy Spirit. But you would, would only say that after you've developed, after you've stepped inside the world of the church, mm -hmm. and then you're saying, okay, I've got these cognitive capacities, mm -hmm. my abilities, the light that I see when things come on and when I see the truth of 2 plus 2 equals 4 or whatever, that to the fullness of what's at stake here, I need to turn to the Christian tradition. But it seems to me that your position is not that position. I make that concession. Mm -hmm. It seems to me yours is a stronger position, namely that the very 
concept of truth that I deploy and whether I know anything at all ultimately depends in a much stronger sense on the truth of the incarnation and this is my last shot at this issue that's my worry great great I'd like to make that stronger claim. I don't know. Yeah, you I do. don't know if I can. Yeah, you can, do. Can pull it off, precisely because I think we've lost in theology the assumption that the, not, not the assumption the the, the the key doctrine that creation itself is made in, for, and through the second person of the Trinity, Jesus. So creation itself should be rendered intelligible because it is. It is made in the word God speaks in Christ. Now whether or not I can always pull this off and, and, and demonstrate it is, is um, questionable. But let, me give you, let, me, let me give you an example. And this, this may just make you a lot more worried. <laughs> I used to watch Marty Stauffer's Wild America with my kids when they were little. Marty Stauffer was, oh, what, what, who was that other guy that, that got the tragic guy that got killed the animal show. Yeah, Steve Irwin. Marty Stauffer was like a, like a, a more gentle Steve Irwin. <laughs> and, it, and it was Mutual Omaha's Wild Kingdom. It'd come on on Sunday night. And inevitably you'd see this fox running through the woods and there's a little bunny hopping out in the white snow, so pleasant. And Marty in his sort of Mr. Rogers voice would say, now what you're about to see is going to be unpleasant. <laughs> but don't take offense, it's just the way of nature. And sure enough, the fox comes running out of the woods, rips off the rabbit's head, blood goes all over the this white snow is filled with red. Now, you know, the fox killed the rabbit. That's true. And you don't have to know Jesus to know that's true. Good. You just have to watch Marty Stauffer's Good. Wild, wild Good. Mutual oh, Omaha. But is it just the way of nature? Is the way he narrated true? Because we don't just have discrete atomistic events in life. Events are always happening in a kind of temporal flux that inevitably connects them up to other things. So one proposition leads to another, which leads to another. And how it all gets narrated is significant. And I would say to my kids, no, Marty's wrong. That's not the way of nature. Go read Genesis 3. The fox is supposed to eat corn, right? Read Genesis 3. So it's actually a sign that something's gone wrong. And it seems to me that, that in that sense, who Jesus is and what he does, does become a kind of signifier that we have to use to make sense of the world, politics, economics, culture, family life. I, I think that's what I'm trying to get at in this work. All right, let me come at this from a slightly different angle. The appeal to Genesis here will give me what I need. Yeah. Oh. Uh, in, in your book, in, in your book here, you, although I'm going to actually bring up Exodus, Okay. Um, and, and I could do it with Genesis as well. In your book, you insist that we've lost the doctrine of the divine names, yes. gone off into philosophical la-la land with the attributes of God, yes. gotten ourselves into all sorts of trouble on that front. <laughs> uh, now, you want to go all the way with Aquinas on this, with simplicity and passability and so on, and God as being, which I do not understand, and I don't think even you understand that, but we'll no. not get into that here. <laughs> now, here's the issue. Uh, I think that you and Aquinas, I'll put it bluntly to you, are reading uh, not some sort of Hellenistic vision of the world into that material. That's too crude, vulgar, mm -hmm. and simple. Mm -hmm. But what you are reading into it is this sort of metaphysical overflow that you've invented for yourself back into that material when God gives his name to Moses, I am that I am. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now it seems to me that uh, we ought to pay far more attention historically to what that meant in its original context, mm -hmm. how that in fact played out in the narrative in, in Exodus, this, and that it, it just seems to me that you are inflating this biblical material off into your metaphysical uh, uh, la la land mm -hmm. and we don't need to and in fact it's going to lead to a, mis to a deep uh, failure of reading of the text appropriately and, and here's the sort of bring it back to Genesis worry <laughs> I mean, it seems to me that uh, we, we, are not, we have now available to us 
a much richer, more accurate account of what's going on in the early chapters of Genesis about creation. And in fact that we've, we've, we've screwed up royally precisely because theologians have said, no, that can't be what the text means. It means this because we've got it going over here in our theological proposals and we'll use that against the standard, the, the, the historical reading of this material. So I suppose my, my worry here at this stage is, is that you are not prepared to give enough weight to a, uh, what I would call a robust, but not uh, functionally atheistic reading of these texts and that your philosophical work in fact is leading at this stage is in danger of really leading to a misreading of this material because you're, you're so high on, on, on this philosophical sort of uh, whiskey. Yeah, yeah. Well, you and I would both agree that, that uh, heretics can read scripture as they did and affirm scripture and yet get the wrong significance or meaning from Scripture. You and I would both agree that Scripture requires the rule of faith, or as Irenaeus put it, the rule of truth, in order to read Scripture well, right? No. We don't? No, we don't agree, we don't agree on that. Mm -mm. I, I thought we just... <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, my reading of it is this, is that the rule of faith uh -huh. uh, uh, grew up in the life of the church, uh -huh. uh, not simply to rule out Gnostic readings of the text, but to read to rule out Gnostic readings of who Christ was. Sure, sure, right. So that the, the the and in fact I now see the problem. I see the difference is really deep here. Uh -huh. It's that I think you read the rule of faith and the scriptures, both of them in their historical context. So that if you read Paul, for example, Paul may well be something of a of a binitarian. A full-blooded Trinitarian vision of God is not available in Paul. That doesn't bother me in the least. Um, because I think it's worked out deeply within the church and sure, it's exactly sure. what we should be committed to. So, uh, right, I, I signal why I'm disagreeing with you, so get back on track and answer my question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think as I you did, will. I would disagree with you about Paul's binary. I think you can get Trinitarian thought out of, out of Paul even. Um, you okay, you okay here, here's the issue, here's the issue. I affirm the, what, what, what I think are the, I hate the word classical, but, but the, the classical accounts of, of who God is in terms of God is, God is isness. That's the very first one, God is. This is all out of the first 13 questions in Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologica, which we read at Wabash High School. No, no, we never did. Um, God is. God is um, um, simple. God is simple, which means God's not composed of parts. God doesn't have form matter. God doesn't have body soul. God doesn't have those things. God is perfection. There's no lack in God's being. And God does not receive anything from creatures. God, therefore, doesn't suffer because only some, something capable of receiving from something suffers. So impassable. Now, and there's some others. God is eternal. And then, of course, God is triune. Now, the question is, are those, is, is that a metaphysical philosophy I'm importing? And what I'm arguing is, I guess it, it doesn't really matter all that much to me whether I am or not, because I think it's true. However, I do think it's fundamentally in the church fathers because it's biblical. It's biblical in this sense. When God says, to, when Moses and God are negotiating, because Moses does not want to be his mouthpiece to Pharaoh, and, God, and he says, well, who sent me? God says... Ekye asher ekye. I am what I am. It's the verb to be, which gets translated into Latin, ego sum qui sum, I am what I am. So it gets, so very early on in the tradition, God's name gets associated with to be, being. Greek, ego hemi o on, ho on. God is the, the being one. Now, I think. And, and there's this long critique now that that becomes problematic, and, and Dr. Abraham doesn't doesn't buy the kind of Harnackian critique of this. Um, that it's all Hellenization, it's all this Hellenistic metaphysics that gets thrown in to the Christian tradition. I think it's consistent with the biblical narrative, because it's consistent with the Ten Commandments, especially the first three, which in one sense are the grammar on how you speak well of God. You find them in the first three commandments. I am the Lord your God, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Do not make for yourself any graven images. In other words, don't reduce God to a creature. God is not a creature. That's, I mean, that, this is revolutionary, right? God is not a creature. Don't make God into a creature. It's very important. 
Um, don't take God's don't use God's name in vain, which doesn't mean you shouldn't cuss. Uh, you know, you shouldn't cuss. It's it's, it's vulgar, but it, it it means you don't use God's name for vain things. But it also means you do use God's name. It assumes you you have to speak of God. You're commanded. You can't just say, "Oh, we can only know of God what He is not, not what He is." But you have to use it well. But you can't use it in any such way that it is used as a creature. Now, I think what that language does, and I think all that it does, simplicity, perfection, being, all it says is God is not a creature. That what is, is God. And creation adds nothing to God. So Anselm's great argument. God is that then which nothing greater can be thought. Which means... God plus creation is not greater than God alone. It is true. I affirm that. I think, I, I think I'm saying something meaningful when I say it. I do not know fully what it means. Okay. Um, we could follow up that, but I'm not going to. I'm going to let that sit for days, which is Since splendid. I'm, I made, I'm convincing on that. No. <laughs> I mean, for, well, let's just take one small issue to okay. show where the difference comes out. Because I, I, here's my worry. My worry is that there's two questions. One is, is it derived from Scripture or is it just compatible with Scripture? I think you equivocate on that. I, I do. I think it's both. You and I don't see why that's a problem. Uh, well, it's a crucial issue as to whether you derive this from Scripture or whether it's just compatible with Scripture. That's not a kind of minor issue. Because you could say it's compatible with Scripture without being derived from Scripture. I would say it's both. I think the Father... But if it's, derived, it's, if it's derived from Scripture, it's automatically uh, compatible with But it. I think Plato and Aristotle almost got it. They didn't quite get it, but they almost got it. But you see, this it. is my problem. You see, <laughs> yeah, you this is exactly <laughs> my problem. And here's where, here's where you want... You have this thing called the classical tradition, which I think you're imposing on the text. That's number one. Uh -huh. And where it comes out on the impassibility issue is that the crucial debates about impassibility in the early church had to do with the suffering of God fully in the divine nature of Jesus. And the, the, the tradition itself canonically insists that in the suffering of the divine Son, God actually suffers. That's possibility. It says, now, uh, Cyril of Alexandria put it this way, the impassible suffers. That's the quote. The impassable suffers. Right, but, but you're, but that, you, that's, that's very important. No, but otherwise you, you, it no, won't be God who suffered. No, if God suffers, that does me no good. No, no, because... I'm just in a fix. If, I mean, because I don't like suffering. Well, that's, that's your hard luck. Uh, <laughs> The, the, and, and, and further, the whole issue of what's meant by impassibility has to be unpacked right. yeah. much yeah. more fully than what you've got here. Yeah. Yeah. And, and whether we make a difference to God or not really does matter, I want to say. Now, I want to, I want to press this on the epistemological front and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, I mean, you've got two fundamental sort of moves that you make. Um, on the, so one is on everything we say basically is related to, derived from, dependent upon our social history, location, or whatever. I may want to get the exact quote here yeah, so, that, I, I, yeah. uh, so that you're not uh, unhappy with that. Let me see if I can find I can, it here. I actually say it on page 13, 14. Um, all speaking of God emerges from a particular social location. All right. All speaking of God emerges from a social, particular social location. Yeah. Now, my worry at this stage is that basically you're giving far too much weight to that proposition. Uh, at one level it seems to be obviously true and not trivial. Uh, you know, that, that you're from Indiana, that I'm from Ireland, that I went to uh, Oxford, you went to Duke or whatever, all those things are very important to us existentially. Yeah. But you, you, it seems to me, want to have that as a background music for the crucial claims that you then want to make about theology and metaphysics and speaking about God. Now, uh, here's where I'm going to go with you and then see whether you want to disagree. Okay. Um, if I want to say, which is true right now, that I'm in Indiana Wesleyan University, I can't say that if I don't have uh, the concept of a university, mm -hmm. if I don't have the concept of Indiana as a state of the United States, <laughs> a whole network of linguistic resources, capacities, and whatnot that are given to me and that are, are and which I'm formed. But the proposition that I'm now, that you and I now are present at Indiana Wesleyan University, the truth of that does not depend upon social location 
or historical conditionedness. That's true or false if in fact I am and you are here at Indiana Wesleyan University. So it seems to me that the whole move that you're relying on here is to take what is either a platitude or an important truth about ourselves existentially and sort of blowing it way up sort of philosophically to levels that we shouldn't do so. And that then are going to mean that you're trapped, that yet you actually are trapped out there, shall I say, on enemy territory and are not going to be able to make the kind of radical rejection of that which I think we should make in our theory of truth. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, I think that's a very important critique and one I would be willing to concede if it leads to the assumption that I do get sort of trapped in a, a historicism. I mean, in one sense, what this book is trying to do is to avoid precisely those kinds of historicist claims. That's why I, I wanted to invoke the term metaphysics, even though so many modern philosophers and theologians, as you know, say we're at the end of metaphysics. I think what's interesting in philosophy and theology right now is there's so many working who are saying we're at the end of the end of metaphysics, thank God. Um, so I, I think it's just, I, I think we were trapped, we were policed by a kind of historicism. Um, and so what I wanted to do in this is, nonetheless, and, and you know, it comes, it comes out of sort of Marxist thought, it comes out of that left-wing Hegelian thought. I didn't want to dismiss it completely because I think there is some truth to it, which is not just trivial, although some of it is trivial. I, I think if you dismiss it completely, then you recover a kind of neo-scholastic rationalism, the assumption that you have a, a universal standpoint that you can ascend to and look over the world and, and sort of put everything in its proper category. I'm enough of a Wittgensteinian, the philosopher Wittgenstein said that was impossible basically, and I agree with him. I don't have that kind of a universal standpoint, or, or an objective standpoint, I should say. But I don't think the fact that I don't have that kind of objective standpoint, that it then leads to the idea that all my knowledge is, and all my truth claims are only relative. As it sometimes gets put, you know, Jesus is the savior for me because he sort of fits within my language game or my culture. I, I don't, I, you know, if that's where it leads to, I would concede in, in a minute. I don't, I, I think the confusion is confusing epistemological and ontological claims. The fact, Stanley Fish put it this way, how we know what we know doesn't change the fact that we know it. That is to say, simply because I can't give, I mean, you know, the epistemological conditions for how I know something doesn't mean I can't make that, that it wouldn't be ontologically true. So, so that's what I. That's what I. I mean, I don't know if that makes any sense. Well, I, 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 I welcome that um, concession, <laughs> um, and I think that. The, my only worry in your response is that you've given us now two alternatives, either the revisionist account that you've given of this initial move, or the neo-scholasticism. We've got to have other options out on yeah. the table. Right, right. We've got to have right. all sorts of other options right. out on the table. And it seems to me correct to say that in certain respects, your social location can either inhibit you or enhance at times, in certain contexts, how you see things. I agree. Uh, so yeah. it's, it's not that I'm dismissing that as being right. utterly false, but it's, if that's the linchpin under which you then want to sort of correct yeah. contemporary theology, then I do think you, the, you run the great risk of, of, of that being a kind of shadow in what you do overall. Well, and, and I think part of what I'm fighting against is, is the marginalization of disciplines like theology and faith in the modern university where in the University of Berlin, someone like Fichte argued that theology couldn't be taught because for a science to be taught, it had to be able to penetrate down into its uh, uh, basic premises and provide objective warrant for them. And theology gets generated out of faith. And I think that assumption is a faulty assumption in that it, it, in one sense, no science or no discipline can do that. Everything at some level, has to be received as a gift. Okay, maybe, can I, one last question, and then if you would line up for, for queries. I, I want to go after you fresh on this fideism worry. Uh, you, you say a lot about fideism in here, and I really am not uh, too worried about that, that, that conception of fideism, but here's the conception of fideism that worries me. You confess that you stand with Bard and that if you were to say that you could give good reasons as to why you think the full and final revelation was given in Jesus Christ, 
then in fact you'd have something more ultimate than Jesus Christ and you'd be worshipping that rather than worshipping Jesus Christ. That's the core of the argument. <laughs> now, uh, you don't know that I have a daughter. I'm telling you right now. Her name is Siobhan. Beautiful name. Good Irish name. <laughs> now, I'm devoted to my daughter. You, you, you don't give her equal pay for equal work, I'll come after you, right? <laughs> now suppose I'm setting out to establish that she exists to you. And I give you a set of reasons. I get her to tweet to you, I get her to call you, <laughs> I uh, get friends to be witnesses, a good testimony for all of this, I give you a whole series, I show you a birth certificate, sure. all sorts of wonderful stuff. <laughs> all that evidence. Now why on earth if I bring you evidence am I then somehow committed to not treating my daughter as the most, you know, the, the second most important woman in my life? <laughs> Uh, beyond my wife, right? right? So it seems to me there's just a, a fatal confusion here between if I appeal to evidence for a, for something, then that somehow means that the, the status of that object to which I appeal for which I appeal the evidence is not absolutely fundamental and central in my ex existential life. So it seems to me a that you've got that problem, and b here's the problem of the fideism. Uh, it seems to me that you're going to hand out blank checks. If I'm a Muslim, I just play the same game. No, I've got the ultimate revelation. And I'm not going to allow any evidence to count against it. I'm going to let no evidence count for it. Because if I do that, I'm not recognizing its divine revelation. I'm, I'm committing idolatry, all sorts of other nasty sins that you want to attribute to us. But it seems to me that that, that is precisely the kind of fideism that we need to resist. We can give good reasons why we believe that Jesus existed oh, yeah, and right, that he's right, the right. Son of God. Sure, sure. And they do not presuppose the truth of those claims. And if this takes us back to the opening question. If that's the case, then there's a, as an independence logically in those claims over against the commitment to the proposition that God was incarnate in Christ and that I worship him as the Son of God. Good. Yeah, those are two, two really important questions as well. Um, to the first, I think I might suggest something like this. Um, uh, your, your daughter is wonderful. She's not Jesus. So in one sense, in one sense, the contingency of your daughter allows for a kind of evidence which would differ in kind from that which God, the Eternal, speaks in the second person of the Trinity. So, I mean, there's, the, it, it's, the, there's, a, there's a contingency in created, createdness which is not, it's not unavailable in Jesus, but it cannot establish the foundation for him in the, sa in the same way it can than everything else that is contingent. So that would be my first claim. Having said that, I, I don't want to mischaracterize. I am a Bardian of sorts and not a very good one. Do you, um, um, I do think that, you, that Revelation conditions all things without being conditioned. But I don't think that doesn't mean you can't give reasons. You can give reasons. You just can't give a uni a, a, an objective ground which will convince everyone, if you were only rational, you would see this. But, now, but, that, that, but that's setting up a false alternative. Uh, it, it may be. I mean, let, me, let me, can I, let me, let me okay. tell you why I think there are, I'll tell you, I mean, there are all kinds of grounds that could, that could uh, falsify Christianity. If we, find, if, we defi if we find the bones of Jesus in the grave, and we, I don't know how we would definitively find it, but we, we, you know, we have evidence and we think, you know, James Cameron, right, <laughs> thinks he's done this. You know, oh, Jesus' bones were in the grave. Well, I, I think that that falsifies Christianity. You know, we'd, we, we would have to become Jewish. The Messiah has not come. Um, we're still waiting on him. Um, uh, we can falsify Christianity eschatologically. When the Messiah comes, we'll ask him, have you been here before? If he says yes, then Christianity will be right. If he says no, Jews were right. I mean, you know, uh, either way, we trust he'll be merciful and kind. Um, you can falsify Christianity aesthetically. You can, you, you can falsify Christianity but, but in you terms see, of, of wonderful. Of well, I'm delighted. You, I'm delighted. In the last comment. I'm delighted you're making these comments, which means that the access to the truth about these claims is not dependent on the incarnation at all. It wouldn't work if you if, if you if the proper if, if the meaning of is true or if my epistemic proposals were dependent upon the truth of the incarnation. None of that actually could work. That's the dilemma I think you've got. But it's a dilemma that we'll take up after. Time. <laughs> very good. Very good. All right. Let's open it up for queries for questions here on the on the on the on the side. Or challenges. Yeah. Feel free to to challenge. <laughs> Mr. 
intended. I can hear you. I don't know about everybody else. Okay, okay. go ahead. Well, I'm a, I'm a math major, so I'm trying. <laughs> oh, good. I never, good. Yeah. They always scare me. I do appreciate talking about things abstractly and philosophically. I do it all the time with numbers. But uh, ultimately, uh, what people are interested in, uh, it seems like it bothers me all the time, but they want to know how it actually applies. So, uh, in the end, something I'm wondering, I don't have to demand it either. In this discussion, what have you learned about you know, speaking well with God then? Students like us, as we're beginning to grapple with the questions that we can grapple with much more deeply, how can we practice uh, certain habits or, or things that will help us understand what it means to speak well with God in our lives and uh, or will actually help us do uh, speak well with God, which is probably good goal as well. What then, uh, without a lot of philosophical terms, can we do? Uh, beyond just probably obvious, okay, be rooted in the Lord, Scripture, be involved in the church. Will those things automatically kind of help us understand this a little bit more? Or is there something specific that you've learned that we, you would suggest us to do to help us kind of learn these things? That's a, that's, I'm going to see if I can reframe this question. It's an excellent question. What we want to know is what, suppose we agree with you. Yeah, right, right. What's the take home here? <laughs> right? And it could be in terms of how can we better speak of God in our practices. Yeah. But it could also be math major. What difference is it going to make to my understanding of mathematical truth? What right. difference would it make if I'm working on... You know, the causes of uh, the troubles in Ireland, or what difference would it make if I'm uh, trying to figure out the cure for certain kinds of cancer? Yeah. Would, would that be a fair way of sort of extrapolating from you to, your, to you? And you're in the hot seat, so Good. it's oh, your theory, okay. so okay. off you well, go. <laughs> um, it's a very dangerous question you pose, very dangerous. It's dangerous for this reason. Knowledge of God is not a useful knowledge. Knowledge, I, I tell students in systematic theology this all the time, this class has no use. Now the reason I say that is precisely because knowledge of God is an end in itself. Knowledge of God is there so that you can enjoy God, worship God, and love God well. So, and I know this is not what you're asking. Um, um, you know, how can I use the knowledge of God? This, this actually came once when I was starting a, a class in systematic theology. I teach in a Catholic school. A lot of the kids have gone through 12 years of, of Catholic parochial education, which became an inoculation against faith for some reason. And um, I remember this one young man was getting very frustrated because he realized he was actually going to have to do a lot of reading in this class and a lot of writing. And it was a theology class. So finally he couldn't take it anymore. He threw up his hand and he said, I'm a business major. How is this class going to help me market a taco? <laughs> and the answer was? It's not. <laughs> it's not. And if it did, I'd be very worried. So in, so in one sense, the wonderful thing about the knowledge of God is it's an end in itself because God's to be enjoyed. And knowledge of God, I mean, knowledge of God isn't like any, it's not like, I was a chemistry major for heaven's sakes. I mean, I remember Grignard reactions, but I don't, you know, they don't, you know, I mean, I don't get all affected by, I mean, knowledge of God is self-involving. To know God is to love God. And I don't think you can separate those things. So, so I, I do think speaking well of God is, is, is to know God well, is to be invited into the love of God. So it's not an instrumental value. It's an end in itself. Having said that, I do think it then reorders everything else. And this is where your question is right. It has to be asked. It then reorders everything else. Alistair McIntyre says the problem with the new atheists, and they're not near as good as the old atheists. I mean, give me Nietzsche any time. I mean, now that, that's an atheist to be dealt with, you know, rather than, than some of these new atheists. The Alistair McIntyre says the problem with the new atheists is they think that no, the belief in God is just one more item, one more item of knowledge in a, in a sort of row of other items of, all, of knowledge to be believed. What they don't understand is knowledge of God reorders all the items. So it's not like it's just one thing, you know, oh, do you believe that, uh, you know, Fords are better than Chevys? Do you believe that? Do you believe this? Do you believe that? Do you believe in God? No, no, it reorders everything. So in that sense, your question is right, and of course I don't have an answer for it. 
because that's an answer that ultimately has to be lived. But, I, but how would this? I'm going to okay, stay, I'm, go How would this reorder what a mathematician is going to do? <laughs> I mean, if you've got some grand new theory of mathematics, I mean, you, you sur you've solved Fermat's fourth theorem right, like right. With, with Andrew Wiles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, this seems to me to be kind of philosophical la-la land. Huh? Yeah, yeah, it could be. <laughs> <laughs> but you better be careful, because what you might be demonstrating is that... Is that uh that, that, that know, the whole that, that God whole, is irrelevant. I mean, no, no, I mean, it's the, not the, that God the, is irrelevant. It's not that it's that you've got an inf your philosophy gives you an inflated account of the significance of theology for other disciplines at this point. No, because theology is the queen of the science. All right, back but, to the back that, to okay, our question. I think this. I mean, in one, I, I don't know since I'm not a mathematician. I don't know, um, but I want to be open. And I, I'll tell you what. I hope it, that, that you, as a mathematician, will be open to the possibility that doing what you do for the glory of God will make a difference in what you do as a mathematician. That's what I, if anything, all I want to do is kind of puncture an imminent policing, there's that word again, an imminent policing which says, you know, that there has to be these very clear disciplinary divisions. Faith is over here, reason is over here, and as William Desmond says, you know, there, there's, a, there's a boundary between them and a passport, you have to get a passport to pass between them. I think you should puncture them so, so that, so, I, so I, I can't, I don't think I can answer your question, but I do think it has to matter. Okay, do uh, you want to come back one more to follow up? And then we've got someone over here. So I, I'm not as concerned as much with the individual disciplines and once we get there. I do believe that knowing God rightly and more fully is going to reorder that. It's the first thing. And I will do my best to figure it out in my own discipline and then we don't chat about our own disciplines. Uh, <laughs> but for that first point, which you said reorders everything, you, you tied it together with knowing God, loving God, and we will speak well of God. How, I, I just want to focus on that point, and then we can handle up all of our own lives from that. How would you pursue that? Would it just be in, in a in that? general sense? Oh. God is best for you? No, I mean, prayer, attendance at church, attendance at the sacraments, contemplating icons, Theological give and take, <laughs> you know, giving and receiving counsel, making public statements, and having them be received or rejected um, uh, in charity and truth, not in not in charity and sentimentality. It's one of the reasons I always like talking to Billy because he'll tell you the truth. I mean, I mean, I think I think that's an act of charity. So there's no single way. There's there's a, an abundance of ways. Um, and, and you're never done, right? It's why, I mean, it's why you have to go back to church every Sunday. You're never done. It's, it's an ongoing... I don't think you even get done in eternity because God is eternal and therefore inexhaustible. It's not like we ever say, ah, I got, ah, I got that mastered. Okay, uh, let's go over here to the left. Unfortunately, we're just about out of time. time. <laughs> yeah, but I wanted to ask each of you, what's the takeaway from your estimation Obviously, you have you share sympathies, but there's some differences about the book. What is the essential takeaway that each of you see in the book? We'll close with that. You first. Okay. Uh, for me, this book's a prophylactic. It's a prophylactic, which I hope, if you read it and it makes sense, when you go to when you go to graduate school. When you, when you listen to John Lennon's Imagine, that horrible nihilistic song of, uh, of modernity, you'll realize that the way some of the options get positioned, if, you're, if, you have, if you think there's dogmatic truth, you will inevitably be violent. That you'll realize that those are forms of policing and that there are other ways to think about them which don't require the violence, which can allow you to be generous human beings, which you, you should be, kind to all your neighbors and welcoming, and at the same time, cling to the truth of your confession. Uh, so in some sense, this book is an apology for places like IWU mm. and a warning, don't become Northwestern University. I, I would say uh, two things. One is, we really do have knowledge of God.